Hey everyone, uh, my name is Matt DiNapoli and you are in the Coding 1002 Introduction to Python for DevNet Create. Uh, just a quick introduction of me. Um, my name again is Matt DiNapoli. I'm a developer advocate with the Cisco DevNet program. Um, I've been with Cisco for 13 years and have actually covered a number of different positions uh, while being around Cisco for that long. Um, I worked in developer support. Uh, I've helped with some systems architecture, uh, but more recently, um, I've been a, a developer advocate that focuses on Meraki, so integrations with the Meraki platform, programmability, uh, teaching Python and REST APIs, all of the stuff that you need to get on board with uh, network programmability. Uh, most recently, I have uh, earned my DevNet Certified Professional. Actually, I should say that was in, in March, uh, right after the DevNet certifications were launched. Um, I passed the DevNet Core exam and the Enterprise Networking Automation exam as well. So I highly encourage that everyone out there um, start to take a look at the, the uh, DevNet certifications. They are a nice feather in your cap on top of all of your uh, networking uh, certifications. So check those out. But let's get into it. So um, basically, why, why are we looking at Python? And um, I'll add a little interesting tidbits of, of information there because uh, network programmability has a number of different things um, and terms and uh, ways of, of doing things that are, can, kind of seem similar on their nose. Uh, but if you actually dig deeper into them, there's some certain um, items within programming languages or tools that can kind of help us out. And we'll focus on Python for this, this session. Uh, but as we have that conversation, um, I'll, I'll talk about a couple of other tools that you may compare and kind of start to wonder why, why they're in the ecosystem. Uh, once we get past that, we'll actually start to uh, dive into the programming language itself. We'll introduce some of the Python basics uh, getting started with creating scripts and, and how to, how to actually um, start using the language. Um, we'll get into some of the meat and logic of working with a programming language. Uh, specifically in Python, we're going to look at conditionals and, and loops. And then finally, we'll put that all together uh, with some scripts and execution. So uh, that's the agenda for the next 45 minutes or so. Um, and hopefully you'll walk away here with an excitement and a passion for working with Python. Uh, so that first baseline, let's let's understand why we're working with Python. Um, so first of all, Python is a, a programming language. It's an interpreted language, um, and you don't need to compile code. So if you're familiar with um, some, uh, I guess you could say, older languages like uh, C++ um, you, or, or C, you would have to compile those codes into binary executables that had to be run on your machines um, in, a, in a very certain way. Uh, Python doesn't need to be compiled. It can be compiled in, in situations where it, it has to be, but it, um, you know, as its baseline, you don't necessarily compile it. Um, and so you can run things as you're changing them. You can make changes, run them, um, and you don't have to worry about uh, minutes or seconds or hours of compiling, depending on how big your application is. Uh, it's also relatively easy to understand. Uh, it's still a programming language. It still has its um, own vernacular, uh, it has its own syntax, and so um, you have to learn those things. Uh, getting started with Python from a understanding perspective is really easy, but moving into uh, becoming a master is, is, can be challenging. So I've been working with Python for about uh, six years now. Um, I would certainly say that I'm well-versed, but I don't know if I could say that I'm masterful uh, because Python is, is a pretty powerful language to work with and can cover a lot of uh, domains, which we'll see in a minute. It is easy to code. Uh, we'll see some instances where um, you can do something in a single line that might take four or five lines um, in, in other programming languages. Um, it handles a lot of the, the underlying stuff uh, you don't have to worry about memory management too much. You don't have to worry about um, uh, creating variables. You don't have to worry too much about casting, although you can cast variables. So there's a lot of computer science-y things that, that Python takes care of um, that you don't have to worry about, especially when you're getting started. That can be a nice thing. And finally, Python is simple. It's relatively easy to get started with. Uh, scripts are, are written in UTF-8 text files, and they can be edited in, in any text editor. Uh, 
Uh, what we're going to see through some of the examples in this session, I'll be using a, um, a development environment, an independent development environment, or IDE, um, known as Visual Studio Code. Uh, this is one that's put out by Microsoft. There are a number of them out there. Uh, one of the ones that uh, is pretty popular with Python developers is called PyCharm. Um, you, know, you can check that out. It is Python specific. Um, I do recommend uh, using a IDE in any situation uh, because there are some nice tools that you can add in that help you uh, perform your coding uh, more quickly and correctly um, for any programming languages, not just Python. So, um, but that's just a quick note uh, for what we're going to be doing later. Uh, some history about Python, um, history and information. Uh, it maintains two stable, version, stable versions, uh, Python 2 uh, .x, I can't remember the latest version of, of 2.x. Um, and then Python, I believe we're up to 3.8 or 3.9. Um, Python 3 is not backwards compatible with Python 2. Um, and it actually took a while for Python 3 to uh, become more readily adopted. Um, it, it initially had been kind of unstable. Um, and we're talking maybe five or six years ago. Uh, when uh, when people were you know really deep into Python 2, a lot of code and tools had been built in Python 2, and so they were a little bit uh, wary of moving to Python 3. Now, the interesting thing with Python 2 more, more recently is that as of January 2020, um, Python 2 will no longer be updated, and it is encouraged that um, all Python 2 applications, scripts, code, be moved uh, to Python 3. That doesn't mean Python 2 won't work. That doesn't mean you can't install Python 2 for the time being. Um, it just means that any new development you may be doing um, should, as much as you can control, be pushed into Python 3. Uh, the reason that I focus on this is that Cisco has a number of libraries uh, that are supported in Python 2 for the time being, um, but they are, are quickly moving to Python 3 and the number of libraries that are being supported in Python 2 is, is going away. So as a developer who's new to the ecosystem, um, if you find yourself running across Python 2, um, you know, be aware that that could at some point uh, be deprecated fully. Um, and it inc also includes a, a tool called pip. Um, these are, are the package managers. These are the libraries that are being installed that other third parties um, might, might have built. Um, they are actually added to a uh, website called pypy.org, so pypi.org, um, and that gives you a baseline of code that you can work with without having to uh, implement it yourself. And so we'll see some examples of that as, as we move forward as well. Python also has an interactive shell. Um, this is useful for testing out those code or those libraries. And uh, there's a couple of different ways you can interact with it. You can um, go through it directly. Uh, by by just typing in, in Python or, or Python 3 to, to kick off the interactive shell. And you can write code within it. And it's kind of like a command line version of the, of the programming language. Um, you can also invoke the interactive shell while running scripts uh, to make sure that you um, have the ability to, to walk through code and identify when um, something is happening in a particular ap application or script. Python also has this, this really cool thing called virtual environments. And um, actually in DevNet, what we, what we recommend is that you use virtual environments or getting the habit of using virtual environments almost all the time. Um, there are scenarios where it might not make sense, um, but as a, a beginner, um, we recommend that you get comfortable with virtual environments and work with them um, as much as possible. I'll do an example of a virtual environment later. Uh, but basically what this means is you are, are using a fresh install of Python with each project you are working on. Um, Python, um, because its code base, especially on Linux machines and Macs, um, has uh, installations that the operating system uses, um, the, the Python installs can get a little messy. Um, and and what can happen is some of the libraries that you're working with could step on each other's toes and cause some unforeseen issues with your application or script as it's running. Um, and so ideally, if you're working in a virtual environment, you um, have a completely clean slate and you know exactly what's interacting with each other. So 
Uh, that's why we recommend that you use the virtual environments when working with Python. So we'll see an example of that in a little bit. And then finally, um, ultimately, why Python in this in this ecosystem, in, in network programmability, in uh, the Cisco world, and all the networking world. Um, first of all, uh, it's super powerful and crazy flexible. Um, so you can build all kinds of applications with with um, Python. Um, you can create backend uh, web APIs, backend uh, servers. You can create shell scripts. You can uh, build front end UIs with with Python as its uh, driving source. Um, you can tie into databases. Uh, it's really um, largely used in educational environments for machine learning, um, for teaching, uh, and so you're going to come potentially come across Python a lot. We can run this on our laptops locally. You're going to see that today. We can run this on servers, on VMs. Um, it is very popular within the cloud infrastructures and running in containers. Um, and most importantly, obviously for Cisco ecosystem, we can run these on a lot of different Cisco IOS, iOS uh, devices, including iOS XE, iOS XR, and NXOS. Um, so being able to run Python scripts either to collect data of, of what's going on with your um, devices or um, to, to set up uh, configurations as they're, as things are running and adapt to, to network changes and situations um, provides that flexibility that uh, other programming languages, just because they're not supported, uh, can provide. And then ultimately, it's domain applicability. Um, a lot of the libraries that um, that you're going to come across are, are Python-based. A lot of the tools that you're going to come across are Python-based. And uh, what that allows for is a um, ecosystem of sharing. So uh, our ability to um, you know, share code with each other, build upon what everyone's working on. Um, and it really uh, makes the ecosystem a lot more rich and uh, provides everyone a lot more capability with what they're looking at. And so um, as you get started with this, we really recommend, um, you know, starting with Python from a programming language perspective. Um, now, uh, before we get into the basics, I want to add a little color to that conversation because understanding um, the domain applicability can bring up some questions around, well, what about things like Ansible or uh, Terraform, if you may have heard of those? Um, those are not programming languages. Those are tools that have their dom own domain-specific um, syntax, um, and they are implemented with programming languages. So, um, for example, P Ansible is actually all Python underneath the hood. And what it does is it abstracts a lot of the interaction between endpoint devices and what you would need to do within a particular programming language. And so um, if you're using something like Ansible, you'll be implementing things in a more um, procedural manner uh, that will uh, walk you through uh, a more simplified way than potentially uh, using a programming language. But then you're dependent on the implementation. And so there's some things that could be potentially be left on the table there where if you have a comfortableness with a programming language with like Python or you know very specifically Python, then you can implement um, some of those things that might be missing. So it is helpful uh, to have an understanding of those tools in the ecosystem because they you could find them potentially useful and you could also find them uh, to be um, quicker to implement than potentially implementing things with a with a programming language like Python. Uh, but where there might be gaps is where you can fill in the blanks with Python. Um, so uh, just one quick example of this that kind of could put this in context. Uh, Meraki now has, Cisco Meraki now has Ansible modules that support a wide variety of action within the APIs. Um, but it doesn't implement all of the APIs. And so if you are doing some certain things within the Meraki, AP, or within the Meraki uh, platform, and leveraging the APIs to do so, Ansible will only get you so far. And if you want to, again, fill in those blanks, uh, let's say, for example, um, you, you can't set the content filtering automatically with uh, the Ansible modules. I don't know for sure if that's the case, uh, but let's say that that's potentially an, an issue. Then you could implement that in Python um, and have those two tools kind of running um, in in parallel uh, to, to get a full wide gamut of what you want to do. Uh, 
So that's the difference between a programming language like Python and a tool that has been implemented like Ansible or, or Terraform. Um, so just wanted to put some context on that so you have a baseline understanding as to why we're doing this. Um, you know, some people, their first question is, well, if I can use Ansible, why would I, why would I learn Python? So let's move on. We're actually going to learn uh, some Python basics now. Uh, it, it, this is always the baseline for understanding any programming language. It is, um, you know, ideally you'll have a little bit of background in, in some basic algebra to, to help this out. But even if you don't, um, hopefully this, this uh, conversation here will kind of help you along the, the path. So the first thing we need to worry about when dealing with um, Python are data types, or this is any programming language, but uh, these are Python specific data types. A lot of what you're gonna be working with um, will be integers, so int, int. Uh, those values will be whole real numbers. Um, so our examples there are negative 128, 0, 42. Um, those would all be classified as integers. Anything that is a floating point number, so anything that has a decimal, um, will be called a float. So um, in our examples there, we have our 1.12 or, or pi. Uh, Boolean, under, and understanding those is very helpful. Uh, Boolean values are true or false. And um, that's big T true and big F false. If you use lowercase t or lowercase f, you will get a syntax error whenever you try to run your application. Uh, one of the most powerful uh, data types is a string. Uh, and so those will be uh, delineated by quotation marks in a variety of ways, which we will see in a little bit. And then finally, uh, we have the uh, byte classes. Uh, this will actually change uh, a string into its set of bytes. And this is potentially useful in instances where we're, um, we, we need to send very specific uh, byte information to a service that might be collecting that. Um, I, one of the, the stories I have for this is uh, I am an Ansible contributor. So um, by happenstance, we updated our version of the Cisco wireless LAN controller and the, I, or the iOS that was running on it. And Ansible wasn't able to log in uh, to that system. And so I had to come through the code to figure out how that worked. And um, the login process, because of the way that Ansible connected to the um, the wireless LAN controller, we had to send the bytes uh, to the actual service rather than a string. It didn't know how to interpret the string. So I uh, had to use the B in front of the string uh, to, to get our, our bytes out of that particular service. Um, not something you're always going to run, uh, run into. Um, web applications in themselves tend to rarely use them. Um, but uh, in certain situations where you're hitting something a little more lower down the OSI model stack, um, you might uh, you might run into that. All right, dealing with strings. Uh, like I said, this is um, probably one of the more powerful uh, data types that you're going to be working with. Uh, they are any Unicode text um, in Python 3.x. You can use a variety of quotation marks. Uh, so you can use single quotes, double quotes, triple quotes, so three quote, quote, quotes, um, or three double quotes. Um, and uh, the reason that you have such flexibility in working with strings in Python is because um, you may be nesting strings within each other. Um, so being able to, to do that is pretty powerful. And it's, it is super challenging, actually, in other, con in other programming languages because, um, because usually you have to escape the characters, and that can get really kind of challenging for understanding what's going on. Um, so in this instance, if we look to the right here where it says nested quote, um, uh, that's a really good reason for why we have the ability to use a variety of quotation marks to offset our strings. If we have triple quotes, um, this is also very useful. Um, you can use um, uh, multi-line strings as well. You can concatenate two strings with a plus operator. Um, you can multiply strings uh, as well if you need to. So uh, walking through uh, and multiplying strings. Um, you can use a dot format for composition. Um, you can split strings up, which is actually kind of nice uh, in certain situations where you're trying to find a specific word in a, uh, in a string. Um, so it allows you to uh, split those based on the specific 
character that you're looking for. So usually it's space, but maybe it's comma delimited or um, tab delimited or uh, semicolon delimited. Just matters which string you're working with. Um, you can join them back together depending on what you need to do. And then you can find the length of a string by using the len library or the len method. So uh, strings, again, very powerful um, and tends to be one of the, the understanding strings and how to use them is probably one of the more useful um, useful skills in working with Python, uh, mainly because we're interacting with uh, device configurations, we're interacting with um, uh, provisioning platforms, that kind of stuff that is that can be kind of text-based um, and being able to, and, and kind of very static in what text is being sent. So if you think about comparing your interaction with um, a CLI versus uh, a web platform, um, the CLI is very uh, distinct in the terms that you're going to use and there, there are very distinct strings you're going to be using. And so uh, being able how to understand to parse those strings and uh, manipulate them is, is very key in your working with, uh, with Python programming language. Next, that moves us into variables. Um, they're reserved memory to store values. Uh, being able to work in with, with and manipulate variables is key to any programming language you're gonna be working with. And so understanding how things are assigned and how their, their data uh, sets are set um, or their data types are set is, is required. Um, they are created with an equals assignment operator. Um, and the nice thing with Python versus some other programming languages is that you don't have to declare your variables. Um, in other programming languages, if you're using an integer, you have to say integer or int, and that data type stays with that variable for its entire time and can be kind of confusing sometimes depending on uh, what you're working on. Now with Python, the type, the data type changes based on the um, based on the, the value that you assign to it. And so that sometimes can be, uh, you know, really nice because you don't have to worry about it, but it also requires you to fully understand what you're working with. Um, and so uh, the, a lot of times you'll be running in, into situations where you think you're working with a numeric that is either an integer or a float, um, but potentially you've called an API and it's sending back data that its numeric is uh, has quotes around it and it creates it as a string. And so um, being able to understand or even writing code that checks the data type and then changes it based on what you need um, is useful as well. So being able to understand that is key. Uh, variable names cannot start with a, a numeric digit. Uh, they cannot conflict with a language keyword. And what that means is you can't define a variable as if. Um, and we'll get into logical uh, words. Um, one, of the, one of the times I actually ran into this challenge was um, from Python 3.5 to 3.6, they added a keyword called async, and A-S-Y-N-C. And async uh, was used um, to allow for asynchronous interactions within that programming language. Um, so it defined um, a very specific activity. And so it was, it was kicked out as a keyword. Well, anyone that had implemented a function, and we'll learn about functions in a minute, that was called async would cause a problem, or if they used a variable called async, it would cause a problem. And one of the libraries in the network programmability ecosystem, uh, specifically, I believe the, the library's NetMiko, uh, implemented a variable or a function called async. And so if you ran that tool or that library in three in Python 3.6 or higher, it would cause a syntax error or a, um, uh, a stack trace problem. And so you'd have to go back and, and, and fix that or actually update NetMiko so it didn't use that async word uh, for that particular uh, instance. So um, not really something that you'll run into quite often, but if you are running into an issue and not understanding why your variable name isn't allowed, it might be because it's tied to a, a language keyword. Once you define your variables or once you start using them, um, you have to understand the scope of them. And this is uh, kind of a challenging thing for people to understand because they um, you know, are writing an application and you're thinking about uh, the code as it's running uh, procedurally, 
Um, but fortunately or unfortunately, uh, variables themselves can be accessible um, either inside or outside of, of pieces of code. And so um, if you're defining a variable within a, uh, a module or a piece of uh, a script in its higher level file, um, that's considered global. Um, it's global within the module. You can actually use a, a global keyword um, to uh, use variables that are defined within the scope of the entire module as well. Uh, so the scope is the whole module or file, and then it's accessible to any module or, or any file that imports that fi Python file as well. So um, these variables are, are accessible across the, across the scale of everything. And so that's why the term global is tied to it. Now, there's a kind of a caveat to using global variables. It sounds like it's going to be easy um, at first, but what, uh, what can uh, turn out to be kind of a challenge is if uh, people start naming variables the same thing, um, especially within functions. Um, and then it can be confusing as to what the actual value of that global variable is. And so um, what we recommend is that all variables, and, and this isn't you know, a hard and fast rule, but it's something that you kind of want to keep in mind as you're working through these things. Um, but if you can pass around variables, um, then you understand that that scope is very limited to those variables and it's very clear as to what those values are. And so you don't have to worry as much about, oh, you know, at what point did this code change this variable? And um, now I'm confused as to what's being set. Um, so ideally, in most instances, if you can, um, we recommend that you try and stick to local variables because uh, it keeps the control of your, your application or your script or your program um, within a, in a place that is well understood. Um, if you start to go outside of that, uh, the global and module level variables uh, can, can get confusing um, and you can get some unwanted results in that. So uh, it, understanding and working with that does take practice. I can tell you about it so you're aware but it's one of those things that you have to kind of put into practice to, to get really comfortable with. So let's look at an, an example of that. Um, so uh, as we're looking at our variable scope example, we have three variables that are defined as part of this example. Uh, the first one is my variable, and this is a global variable. It's a module variable. It's outside the, the, the definition of my function. And so the scope of it is available to everything. Now within my function, we have my local variable and it's set to, this is a local variable. And then within that, we change my variable to, this is a local variable with the same name as a global variable. So within my function, and this is why it can be confusing as to what we're, what we're setting. If you call my function uh, directly, uh, we'll get the printouts of the things that are defined within that function. But if you just print out my variable, um, it will define the global variable. Now, if you don't call the function and you try to actually access my local variable, um, you will get a error because that function, that variable is not defined outside of the function itself. And so uh, to be able to access it, you have to actually go into the function as it is. So um, scope is very key in understanding what is going on with variables. Um, if you're getting a weird situation where you don't fully understand what's going on with a particular output, um, it tends to be the scope of the variable. Um, this happens to people who are new. This happens to people who have been working in the language for a long time. Um, the scope of the variable and understanding that scope of that variable is very key to um, being able to uh, manipulate and change and, and update variables as they as they are used. So uh, be very aware of scope. Um, if you if you don't fully understand it today, that's okay. Um, go out and play with these things a little bit to understand how those how those things play out. In Python, everything is an object. Um, this is something that uh, makes Python crazy powerful. Uh, so there are methods that are part of every data type that we that we talked about. And so if we look at um, the integers or the numerics, the, the floats and the integers, um, they have an is integer or you can look up the bit length. 
uh, for strings. This is for strings. This is probably the most powerful thing within Python. Um, they have uh, uh, lower uh, being able to change strings to lower values, lowercase values, being able to string change strings to uppercase values, um, being able to check the length, being able to find uh, substrings within there um, without having to do a lot of manipulation of the values. Actually, you don't have to do any. Um, you can actually just use the, the, the functions that are part of it. You can access the uh, functions or methods that are available to a specific object or data type uh, through the DIR um, directive. And so that'll tell you what's available to you. Uh, it'll also show you the attributes. So there are things about the, the objects that are available to you. So if you think about an object, um, an object has attributes, so things that define it, and um, functions or methods that you can action upon it. And so um, being able to understand that opens up a whole new world of, of capabilities in working with a programming language. This isn't always the case with programming languages. And so Python taking that notion of saying, all right, everything's going to be an object. Um, it, it makes a, a lot of the, the things that you do over and over again a lot easier. Um, so you access them through something called dot syntax. So we have our variable and then dot and then either the method or the attribute that you're trying to access. And um, and so, yeah, that's that's uh, using objects in Python again, uh, similar to working with variables and variable scope, uh, becoming comfortable with them is something that uh, just takes a lot of practice and, and working with it. So that's where we're, that's what we're looking at there when we say uh, Python, everything is an object. Now. We're working with variables. We identified the, the fact that the, the data types themselves have objects. And then there, as we move down the chain, or actually up the chain, in, as far as uh, complexity of variables, um, we had our integers, strings, bytes, uh, floats. Now we're, now we're dealing with um, advanced data types, or mainly collections. So these are um, different ways that we can consume um, mapped data, I guess you can say. So probably the first one you're going to come across and the thing that um, you'll use pretty regularly are called lists. Um, you might he hear them called arrays as well, just depending on um, who's talking and what, what vernacular they're using. Um, but the list is an ordered list of items. And so what that means is uh, very specifically, the item in the first spot will always be the same. The, always, the item in the second spot will always be the same unless you adjust them. Um, but once it's set, that's the way that it is. Um, the items can be different data types, although it tends to be used in situations where the same data types are, are used in place. Um, and it can contain duplicate items, depending on what you're working with. Um, and they are mutable, so they can be changed after creation. A tuple is similar to a list, um, except it can't be changed after it's created. Uh, so you cannot adjust uh, the values in a, in a tuple. All you can do is copy the values of a tuple into a list or recreate a tuple in a different way. Uh, so that's, uh, there's a very specific reason why tuples exist, um, and it tends to have to do with the next um, data set, which are dictionaries. And these are, uh, they are unordered key value pairs, although there is an ordered dictionary as well. The keys are unique um, and themselves must be immutable, but the values, the, the values that are tied to them are, are mutable. So you can change the, the values. Um, you can get to the keys or the items or the values um, through functions um, or methods that are part of the object that we saw, like, like we talked about previously. And what those create are tuples um, that you can then access in an ordered manner. The, the challenge, um, and, that, and that's, that's, the, that's the reason that the tuples exist, uh, because they don't want you changing that particular array because they wanted to keep it in sync with the actual values in the dictionary. The keys themselves don't have to be the same data type. Um, and the values, again, themselves can be other data types. Values within a dictionary can be lists. They can be tuples. And they can be other dictionaries. And so um, we can see a lot of these nesting of, of data sets within themselves. Uh, this is particularly um, this is particularly 
notable when dealing with REST APIs and JSON. So um, in Coding 1001, you were introduced to JSON and the JSON structure in and of itself ties very closely to a Python dictionary, um, so much so that it is just a matter of converting the serialized string of JSON to a dictionary and then being able to pull out those name value pairs allows you to parse that information um, uh, very easily. So that's that's the tie into the, the APIs that you learned about in 1001 to the code that we're going to be implementing in 1002. Uh, quickly working with collections. Um, so uh, the first type we are looking at is a list. Uh, when we're creating them, it's just a matter of defining them within the square brackets. We access those um, individual values through what's called an index. Um, lists in, lists and tuples index at zero. And so the first value is zero, the second value is one, and the third value is two. And so it's just, um, that's the order that they start in. So if we're looking at our specific example here, uh, at the top there, we have L2, L sub two is 18.2. That's the third value in that list because they're indexed off of zero. Uh, we can update any of the values within there by similarly assigning them specifically. So if we change L sub two to 20.4, it will change the tuple or the uh, list value to 20.4. We can concatenate lists as well. Uh, so we can add them into each other. Uh, we can also sort them as necessary. So remember they're unordered. Um, so being able to sort them can be helpful depending on your application. Similarly, tuples work in the same way, except you can't update them. So uh, being able to, to actually um, change them is, is not possible. And then finally with dictionaries, uh, this is where people struggle at first, but then uh, become pretty well versed when they work with them enough. The ability to get at a value is dependent on the key name. So in our example here, we have D sub oranges, and that gives us the value of nine. Or you can use the method get, and that will get us the key value for that. We tend to use the notation above in DevNet, so um, either one will, will get you the same thing. If you want to update values based on the key name, uh, so that's, that's available. And then I mentioned earlier that you can get to the items or the keys or the values from, or the items will give you the name value pairs. The keys will give you the actual keys of those and the values function will give you the actual list of values. So um, some very useful um, things that you can do uh, as part of the dictionaries and helpful when trying to parse them. Uh, the biggest task that you're going to do in network programmability is get information from a device or a platform or a controller and parse it. And being able to understand how that data is formatted, either in a list, a tuple, or a dictionary, will be helpful in writing your application to do that parsing. Um, uh, and the main key takeaways are lists uh, will be delineated by square brackets and dictionaries will be delineated by those curly brackets. Now, when you're dealing with JSON, valid JSON can come back as a list as its top parent, um, or it can come back as a uh, dictionary or, or an object. And so uh, being aware of what that first character is in the JSON that's coming back will help you determine how to parse it, what the data set looks like when, when you've converted it from uh, JSON into a Python either list or a dictionary, depending on the situation. So now it brings us to conditionals and loops. Um, we have conditional expressions. Uh, all expressions have a minimum of one operand, although you can have uh, two or even three in certain situations. We won't get into that. That makes things kind of crazy. Um, operands uh, are the objects that can be manipulated. They can be values themselves or they can be variables. So it just depends on what you're working with. Um, and everything is evaluated to a Boolean. So classic logic tables apply. Um, we have less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, equal, not equal, and contains. Um, we also have the ability to not all of that with an exclamation point. Um, so if you uh, if you want to say, you know, not equal or, or not less than or equal to, you can um, put the, either the word not or or the exclamation point around that to to make that work. And now that brings us to logical operators. And you can combine those uh, conditional expressions with the logical operators to 
uh, meet the necessities of a logic table. Now you're not limited to two expressions. You can have any number of expressions that you want. Uh, this table itself indicates the, the baseline of what you would be doing with ands, ors, and nots. Um, and so this ties to a classic logic table um, combining, for example, you would read this combining two conditional expressions with or, um, and one evaluates to true and one evaluates to false will return the result of true. Um, so those expressions themselves are evaluated from left to right. Uh, similar to what we talked about earlier, understanding how these things are going to work will be tied to how much you use them and, and your testing. And you'll become well versed in, in how using ands, ors, and nots will tie into those conditional expressions. So ultimately, that comes down to uh, building our conditionals. Um, so on the right hand side here, we have an example of um, checking for a value of b. We set b equal to 5 and then print out different statements based on the, the evaluation of the conditionals. Um, the first one just checks for it if it's less than 0. Um, if it's equal, the second one is, is if it's equal to zero. Um, and then um, the else if is greater than two and less than seven. And so we're checking between the values of three and six because the, the, um, the less than and greater than symbols are exclu exclusionary. Um, if it was less than or equals and greater than or e than and equals, then it would be inclusionary and it would be then two and seven. Um, so our value here, because it's five, B is between two, or B is between three and six. So um, the scope of those conditionals is based off of indentation. And uh, in other programming languages, you might see curly brackets around conditionals. Uh, but in Python, everything is based off indentation. The scope of everything is based off indentation. So we have our conditionals, and that's, uh, you know, the logic that we build into our applications, the ifs and else ifs and else's. And then the other way that we can kind of run through things is through for loops. Uh, so being able to iterate through things. Now in Python, um, the nice thing is you can have a collection of things, so names, and pull out the individual values. So name and names in our particular example here. Um, in other programming languages, you have to have an iterator that counts through everything in for loops and keeps track of the index. For Python, they made it really nice because you can think about it as a bucket of things and then pulling out one thing. Um, and you can change that value to whatever you want. It doesn't have to be very specifically the plural and the singular name for that. Those are the variables that are av available to us. Um, so uh, the scope of the, the variable, though, is tied uh, similarly to the conditional. It's, it's, you know, where it can only access name within this loop. Um, if we were to come out of the loop, name would not be defined. And so, um, but we could access names uh, because it is outside of the, the loop itself. While loops, you won't run into as much, but you um, may run into them uh, a lot when running applications that have to do something over and over and over again, um, ideally never stopping. <laughs> and that's when you're going to run into something that's called while true. So it is the the boolean evaluation is occurring at the statement so it's basically saying if this thing is true then do all this stuff over and over and over again until it's not true and then um so you might see web applications are actually uh implement this a lot you'll see while true keep doing this over and over and over again until you break um and if we hit a break we can put in a conditional statement to break that as well um I wouldn't necessarily recommend using whiles um, unless the situation dictates it and you fully understand what you're doing, um, especially with while true, because the while statements can cause um, applications to consume a lot of resources if you are doing something um, computationally intensive. So be careful and aware of, of using while loops in that situation. Uh, we saw a function, uh, an example of a function earlier when talking about variables, uh, but ultimately you don't want to repeat yourself. If you're going to be doing something more than once, we're going to put that into a function. Functions like conditionals and loops are defined by indentation, indentation, indentation. Do not forget that. Um, they can accept arguments. Um, so in our example here, the circumference, circumference function is accepting a argument called radius, and then it's indicating um, uh, that it is uh, performing the uh, 2 pi r uh, 
to get the circumference whenever uh, performing that math activity and giving us our uh, value back. So um, functions themselves are a way to create code that is going to be reused. So if you do something twice, uh, put it in a function and then call it, because then you can use it over and over again. We mentioned Python scripts and execution. Uh, the file extensions are .py, they're UTF-8 files. You can use any text editor, but um, I recommend using an in independent development environment. And then there's no need to compile and you can execute those in the interpreter themselves. Importing and using package modules, you're gonna come across this relatively quickly in using APIs, so what we learned in Coding 1001. Uh, the main one you're gonna be looking at first is uh, the, called the requests library. And that is going to um, allow you to make those REST API calls within your code. And so um, the main way you do that is import the library name. Uh, if it's something that is a standardized package as part of Python, you just have to import it. Um, if it is something that is outside the standardized packages, then you do have to do a pip install into the into the uh, project that you're working on and then and then you import it and so um, if we were to do an example of this let's actually copy our code here let's create a new file so we're going to create a new python demo.py and then we will open that file All right, in that file, we'll do import requests, and then we'll do the, what, what is in the example do response is the variable that we're going to be filling in, requests.get, and then we'll just do the example that we have there, https, google.com, and response status code. Uh, you learned about status codes in, um, we'll do a print on that. So I mentioned running um, spell response, right? I mentioned running uh, virtual environments. Uh, the easiest way to do that with Python three is to um, use the dash m v e n v script, and what that'll create a virtual environment for you. You'll notice in your IDE it'll find that out, and then you activate that by going source the name of the environment that you created, which was Vemv in this situation, and then we'll activate that. And then uh, because we're using requests, if I don't install it, uh, if we just run Python demo, uh, we'll get an error because no module name requests has been found. So we'll do a pip install requests. It'll do that install for me. And then if I run the code now, we should have a successful run of it, and we get our status code back of 200. I'm able to hit google.com uh, when working with that. So uh, that is how uh, we use our libraries and what happens if we don't import them correctly. So let's head back into the presentation. And um, there's basic IO you can go through. Uh, this can be useful for console type applications, so you can get input with input. Um, you saw us dis display output with print um, in that example that we just did. And you can pass multiple values into those things depending on what you need uh, for your input. This is a Python script example. Um, and you kind of read this from the bottom up. Um, so you have all of the defined things on the left hand side there. Um, what we're importing for our libraries are global variables and then the functions that are defined. But the application actually starts at the bottom. Um, and it's looking for that main uh, script to be executed. It's calling that function main, so we can then jump up a level to that def function main. Um, and then it's call calling another function called generate fortune. Generate fortune is expecting to um, return a string. Um, so that's that little caret that you see right there. And um, it's going to use the random library and use a method called choice to uh, pick from the two fortunes that are there. So um, if we were to copy and paste this um, and run it, uh, we should be able to um, uh, get our, our random choice that is coming out of that. So we read that from the bottom um, up to the top there and to follow along with what's happening with the code.
executing, as we saw with our example, it's just a matter of uh, running the Python 3 is probably what you're going to end up doing most often since Python 2 is, is being deprecated. Um, it depends on your installs of Python on how that will actually work, so be aware of that. Um, they're executed in the terminal, and they'll run based on the code that you've written. So uh, that's everything that we have for in our introduction to Python. Um, there's a lot of information. Uh, you know, I recommend going out to python.org, uh, checking out some of the documentation. Um, there's uh, some, some challenges that are available to you as part of the um, of, of DevNet Create. So uh, go check those out as well. Um, some will include Python. So uh, that's why it's useful to have this under your, under your belt. So thank you very much for your time. Again, I'm Matt Apple. You can check me out at, at the DNAP on Twitter. And uh, hope you enjoy the rest of uh, DevNet Create. Thank you.